Ready? We are ready. Okay. So this is JJ Pianchi of the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. I'm doing on June 30th, 2017, at the University Library in Urbana, Illinois. Um, so I would also like to say that if there's any questions that are uncomfortable, feel free to pass. Okay. Or don't apply. Um, where and when were you born? Jacksonville, North Carolina, November 6, 1952, at uh, the Naval Hospital at Camp Lejeune. Navy all the way. Marine Corps. Marine My Corps. dad was a Marine. There you go. Um, who were your parents, and what were their occupations? My father was Percy Franklin Jones. My mother is Mary Ellen Lee Jones. He um, was an enlisted Marine for 30 years and then had his own barber shop. My mother was a state employee taking care of disabled, mentally disabled children. Do you have any siblings? I have three uh, siblings, an older sister, Mary Franklin Jones Hansen, uh, a brother, Percy Franklin, or Percy Lee, rather, Jones, and then um, my younger sister, Sally Louise Jones Gonzalez. And did any of them serve in the military? My brother was an Army helicopter mechanic. Okay. Which one? My brother. Your brother, right. Sorry. Um, what were you doing before you entered the service? I was a law librarian at Nova Southeastern University College of Law. Cool. And you entered the Navy? Yes. Okay. Uh, and you enlisted? Uh, well, you were sworn in as an officer. That's different than being enlisted. Okay. Um, Why did you choose that branch of the service? Um, because my dad was a career Marine. I'd been on Navy bases most of my life, and I'd seen uh, female um, Navy officers, especially Navy nurses, in their dress blues, and they were very impressive to me. I did not want to go in the Marine Corps because it had a reputation as being very macho. I thought it would be too challenging mentally maybe. You know, I, not that I couldn't do it, I just felt like I wouldn't be as happy there as in the Navy. Um, and the reason I went in instead of going ahead and practicing law after law school is I didn't want to live in Florida most of my life. I wanted some adventure. and. Uh, I thought the Navy would give it to me. Oh, nice. What happened when you departed for training camp and during the early days of training? Well, I was sworn into the bar in Florida in December of um, 2002. Our, sorry, that's wrong. That's not right. What date was it? 1982. 1982. <laughs> so I uh, uh, took a flight to uh, Pittsburgh to see a friend. Then I went on to Newport, Rhode Island, and that's where officer indoctrination was at the Naval Education Training Center there at Newport. And um, we first went into officer indoctrination where they teach you how to wear your uniform and salute. They teach you customs of the Navy. We had a training exercise in damage control where you're in a ship mock-up and they flood the compartment and you actually have to use wooden braces and work in a team to you know, get those things braced and malleted in. And um, so that was my experience there. And then after officer indoctrination, I went to Naval Justice School to learn about the Navy's court system and rules of evidence. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, do you recall your instructors? And if so, what were they like? I certainly recall the instructors. Officer indoctrination, there were a lot of um, female officers. And uh, you know, about a third of them were male officers. They were very strict but encouraging and I felt like this was you know something I was meant to do and then in justice school uh, there was a marine uh, colonel who was the dean of students and she was very um, also tough and encouraging the instruction I got in both officer indoctrination and in naval justice school was really top-notch and superb and I think it gave me a real 
a foundation for transitioning uh, into being, you know, active duty. We're, of course, active duty. We're wearing our uniforms, but it's not quite the same as being out in the fleet. So your specialized training was with the Justice Department or with, with the Justice Branch area. Right, because okay. I was coming in as a Navy JAG officer, Judge Advocate General Corps, and in officer indoctrination, there had been all kinds of staff officers. There were dentists, engineers, um, uh, other kinds of nurses, uh, any other kind of um, service support kind of officer is what officer indoctrination was for me. Did you receive any other specialized training? Uh, after I was in Pearl Harbor, which was my first duty station, the Navy really emphasizes training. So there was a lot of specialized training in um, investigations into accidents, um, whether or not someone had acted within the course of their uh, employment, um, lots of sexual harassment training. Training was constant. How did you adapt to military life, including the physical regimen, barracks, food, social life, et cetera, et cetera? Well, that wasn't hard. Uh, when we were in um, officer indoctrination in J school, it was like um, camp, sort of, you know. We had to stand inspections. We had to make sure that our room was completely clean so we would wear our sweats and get on the floor with a wet uh, towel and go over every corner of the floor. And then as you finished, you'd back out. And somebody else would have their uni your uniform in their room, and you'd go and change into your uniform. But I should have said, too, before you even started that, you'd clean the windowsills with a, a uh, um, you know, what am I thinking of? One of those things you used to clean your ears. Yeah. Q-tip. 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 That's what it was. Anyway, you'd, you'd take that and you'd make sure there was not a speck of dirt in the window, on the walls, on the floors. The beds were perfectly made. You could bounce a quarter off of them. Everything had to be perfect in your locker so that all the uniforms are hanging up, everything's folded, nothing haphazard. I hate almost to ask what would happen if something was out of line. You'd get demerits. You'd have to do push-ups and running. And one time um, I made the mistake of ironing my uniform skirt and the iron was too hot. And I got a patch that was burned on my skirt. So we're standing at attention outside the doors. I've got my arm turned so that it's like hiding that. <laughs> and I'm standing there petrified and <laughs> I didn't get caught. So I was really happy because it was in January in Rhode Island. We're right on the point of the bay and it was cold as hell. I was in the Navy. <laughs> um, and you didn't want to have to get out there and do that running if you didn't have to. Right. Absolutely. Um, so where were you stationed? My first duty station was in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And my second duty station was as the lawyer for boot camp in San Diego. And after I left active duty, I stayed in the reserves and I was stationed at um, Bremerton, Washington, Bangor, Washington, and Everett, Washington. And when I was in the reserves, I would do my two weeks of active duty quite often at Coronado in San Diego. Okay. Uh, did you go abroad at all? I went to uh, the Philippines, Japan, and um, Hong Kong. And uh, that w those were for vacation more than anything else. I went to meet my husband's ship when he was in Hong Kong mm -hmm. and um, had fun doing that. So you didn't um, go abroad with the military? I wasn't stationed abroad, no. Stationed abroad. Okay. Um, what kind of friendships and camar camaraderie did you form while serving and with whom? Well, almost always your friends are who you're stationed with because it's a very intense experience. We're trying cases all the time. I never went anywhere that I didn't take case files with me. 
and quite often I'd be working from 4 o'clock in the morning until about 10 o'clock at night. This is very true on shipboard too. 18-hour days are very common. And so my closest friend was Sherry Hawkins, uh, who was from Shelbyville, Indiana. And um, Sherry and I did everything together. She had a little T-top sports car, and on Sundays, we'd buy two bottles of champagne and drive all the way around Oahu, <laughs> stopping at beaches and having fun. Nice. Um, how did you stay in touch with family and friends back home? Well, in those days, you know, it was before cell phones, so it was difficult because of the time difference, and that was one thing, even when... You know, we had to do some business with talking with somebody in Washington, D.C. at the Navy Yard. We'd have to get up early because if we didn't get in the office early, it was, you know, like an eight-hour difference. You couldn't talk to them. And the same with my family. So I'd have to plan when I was going to be able to reach them so that it wouldn't be too late for me to call them. And so that's what I did. Mostly I... I um, Wrote my mother, you know, notes and letters, but most of the time I'd, I'd call. Mm -hmm. um, what did you do for recreation or, uh, or when you were off duty? In Hawaii, there was a lot to do. We were always at the beach or hiking or going and um, looking for mangoes and guavas. There were a lot of um, things to do with native culture, with Hawaiian culture in Hawaii. And so... Um, that sort of thing. Then there also were what we call mandatory fun, where the command would have a picnic or a baseball game and we'd have to participate. And so there were a lot of those kinds of things. And there were also, there was a lot of um, luau's and shopping and, you know, going to the Navy Exchange and um, having friends come to visit. Lots of friends came to visit in Hawaii and San Diego. Hawaii. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. When you were in the service, did you read for pleasure? And if so, what? Oh, I've always read. Since I was a kid, it's always been super important to me. And so I was reading a lot of Anne Perry mystery novels, um, mostly, mostly fiction, um, rarely nonfiction, but I got very involved with um, science fiction and fantasy, reading a lot of that, too. What particular book would you say influenced your life the most and why? Oh, Alice in Wonderland, definitely. As a child, I read it again and again and again, and it just captivated me. I loved The Cheshire Cat, The Tweedledum and Tweedledee, the idea of going you know, down the rabbit hole to adventures, and it just um, was something that fascinated me. Did you use libraries when you were in the service? Why or why not? I didn't use the base library because it was really geared to um, families. But I did use the legal library, of course, because it was required for our work. And uh, as because I'd been a professionally trained librarian before I came on active duty, that was my collateral duty also. So I took care of the, of the library. So when did you muster out, out of, out of active duty into reserve? I came out of active duty in 86 and went into the reserves in January of 87. And how long were you in the reserves? 17 years. Oh, wow. Um, how was your readjustment to civilian life after active duty? I missed being on active duty a lot. Um, but. When I came off of active duty, I wasn't sure what I would do exactly because I had the choice of either practicing law or coming back to librarianship. I'd gotten a law degree so that I could be a law library director. And so I started thinking about what would I do if I wanted to practice law? Because it seemed like you know I'd gone into the Navy partly to get some trial experience, some legal experience to add to my qualities as a law librarian. But I thought I should also give some serious thought to whether or not to practice law. So I started thinking, you know, I really hated criminal law 
because everybody lies to you, including your own witnesses. I really didn't want to do family law because it's so sad and bankruptcy as well. I'm not fond of small details and crunching numbers, so tax and bankruptcy were, you know, kind of not securities, not my things either. And I'm really captured now by the internet and privacy and cybersecurity, but that didn't exist then. So I decided to come back to law librarianship, and I got an offer of a job at the San Diego County Law Library and another offer of a job at the University of Puget Sound. My husband was from Seattle, and he wanted to go back there, so I took the job at Puget Sound. And it was difficult because I was used to working all the time, and I didn't see that when I returned to the civilian world. Gotcha. And so you said earlier that your husband was in the service for 30 plus. 20, 27 active 27. duty. Um, so is he still in active? So what is he doing now? He's retired and he, um, after he left active duty, he uh, worked as a quality control investigator with Boeing. He was a special master at arms in the California legislature and he worked briefly for Procter & Gamble and then decided he didn't have to do any of that. He could quit and play golf and have fun. So that's what he's doing. Gotcha. How did you land up at UIUC? Just out of curiosity. I um, had a dean who was a super micromanager and I'd been at my job for 11 years and I really thought I'd like a new challenge and my younger stepdaughter and her family live in Peoria. Her, um, she and her husband were engineers with Caterpillar and my, younger, my husband's youngest granddaughter is her daughter. They live in you know Peoria a couple of hours from here. And um, I talked to a friend in DC and I said, you know, I'd really like a, another job and she nominated me for Illinois and I was interviewed and it took a you know good year before it all got resolved, but in any case I I decided for professional and personal reasons to come to Illinois. It's all about the grandbabies. <laughs> it's been fun to see her close, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, have you remained in contact with or reunited with fellow veterans, and if so, who? I keep in contact with some of my friends. Ellen McGrath, who is a Social Security judge, um, and she lives in um, California, and not too much of anybody else, although I know where almost everybody is. You know, our lives have gone in different ways. I'm much closer to friends from my Navy Reserve unit in Seattle. Okay. Um, are you a member of any veterans organization? And if so, which? We're not formally affiliated with any vet organizations. Um, the reason why is that a lot of them are more conservative than we are. And also, we're not really kind of the people who like to join things. You know, when I was, um, <laughs> my husband was on his last ship, the Peleliu, the Navy Relief people, or the Navy League people actually, would come. And they would have um, burials at sea for past vets and stuff. And he always didn't want to be one of those people who, you know, they're old and they're wearing their Navy medals and stuff like that. And I kind of felt the same way. Although I make sure to always put it on my resume because I'm proud of it, I'm just not much of a joiner. Okay. Um, as a veteran, have you used your local library? Why or why not? I uh, don't use the local library uh, because I like to buy things and have them on my Kindle. Um, like mo a lot of librarians, I'm a book collector. I have a lot of books of my own. In fact, my husband said to me one time, you have too many books. I said, you married a librarian. You should know better. <laughs> but I do understand that the local, you know, Champaign County Law Library is really good. I know people that are on the board of the library. And because I'm in a library every day, I think that's probably another reason why I don't use the library. As a veteran, are there programs or types of books available at the library that you enjoy more than others or would enjoy more than others? 
Well, my tastes have changed. I've broadened, and I like reading nonfiction, like uh, Sharon Isles book uh, about Hamilton, and I'm uh, very interested in our current state of affairs with um, what we're doing in Iraq and Afghanistan. I read Fiasco and Green Zone and a number of things like that. I'm uh, also really interested in what's happening with our country right now, with, with the president we have. And so I'm reading a lot of things about hacking, America's spies, and looking at the, the crossover between law and national security and privacy. So that's, that's where I'm at now. As a veteran, is there something you wish you could change about the library that would enhance your enjoyment of it if you were going? I um, noticed that when we were at Florida State um, that both the university library and the law library did a um, presentation, you know, a PowerPoint slideshow that was on a monitor for Veterans Day and they actually recognized people who were in, you know, who were law students or who were uh, workers or staff or professors. I think it would be really useful to have more of that going on in libraries because only 1% of the population currently serves. And I do think it's a, a good thing across our society if more people serve so that people who stay in their small areas, you know, they get out into the military and they see different kinds of people. I think it's a very great um, leveler in society. And so I'd, I'd like to see libraries promote more of, you know, who are people that served and what were their experiences. So this project you have is a great one. Thank you. Um, how did your military experiences affect your life? Well, my husband and I are both very proud of being in the Navy and I think it gives us a framework for how we think about patriotism and respect for the rule of law and um, you know how our government works. And so um, one of the things that was emphasized in the military is that there's civilian control of the military. So it's really important that we have honorable people in the presidential and executive branches and you know the courts and in other places everything rests on integrity and that was also something that was very you know much stressed in the military so those values are things that i think um, really were um, impressed upon me when i was on active duty and in the reserve what are some life lessons you learned from military service Not volunteering is a real good one. <laughs> um, trying to make sure that you um, do follow the rules. Although I have to say, my personality is resistant to rules. And so it's been a funny thing in my life that I chose things that were very authoritarian <laughs> and then sort of subverted them in some way or made them individualized for me. So I'm, I'm not really a rule breaker, but sometimes if it's a stupid rule, <laughs> I like to see how far I can push it. Um, so the military had uh, some interesting experiences with that where, you know, you. We had a guy in my unit, this is so funny. We all stood inspection one morning, and instead of his uniform core fram shoes, those black patent leather shoes, mm -hmm. he had on black Gucci loafers, and the CO chewed him out. Mm -hmm. And so there were a lot of those kinds of funny things that happened too, sometimes to me, sometimes not to me. <laughs> I've never been chewed out by a judge so much as in the military. Um, is there a particular instance of subverting, <laughs> of, of going against the grain that you can share with us? <clears throat> well, 
Well, we had a CO who um, had been in D.C. most of the time, and he was not well-liked. And so one night, we had a, one of those mandatory fun events where he had the command picnic, and we all had to go. And he lived in a beachfront house in military housing at Barber's Point in Hawaii. And so all the lieutenants in the command had a nude swim in the beach <laughs> off of his house. <laughs> Just to kind of show some disrespect. <laughs> nice. Um, okay. He was not well liked at <laughs> all. <clears throat> How did, sort of going off script for a minute, how, how did you get along with CEOs that were well-liked? Oh, Captain Powell was my first CEO in Hawaii, Captain George Powell. Um, I think he got the best out of people because they did like him and respect him at the same time. You know, he wasn't someone that you would say, oh, he's a pushover. He definitely had standards that he wanted, but he wasn't, he was fair. I felt like my second CO was really sexist. It was clear that the guys in the command had more credibility with him than the women did. And it felt to me as if, and I'm, I think this is accurate, people pick who looks like them as winners. And we weren't male, even though some of us were some of the best lawyers in the command, one of whom ended up being a judge in the Navy. And um, so that was the difference. Captain Powell was re really respected people in their work. He did everything he could to encourage them and promote them and make it easy for them to do their work. And Captain Manning was just the opposite. Did you, I mean, you just mentioned sexism. Did you encounter that a lot in the service? I did, and sometimes it was in a funny way. We had to wear um, white uniforms in Hawaii, you know, the, and you have to stand up very straight. And in fact, the back of your uniform shirt is ironed with three creases. There's a crease in the middle, and there's a crease on either side, so there's one, two, you know, sort of those quadrants. Mm -hmm. And um, I would have to go, we were liaison to various ships and stuff. So I'd have to go down to the harbor and cross the quarter deck and um, go in and see the CEO or the XO and talk with them about whatever we were doing. Um, you know, if they had a court martial that I was prosecuting, um, I had to go and talk with them about it. And as I would cross the quarter deck, because I'm fairly large up top, I would always feel like I was kind of a walking boob. <laughs> because I'm the only woman around, and there are all these guys, you know? And I felt like you just got to stick them out there, girl, and just be who you are, because it isn't, you can't make it different. <laughs> gotcha. Do you think the sexism impacted your ability to, to be a jag? I think I had to fight it in order to be as successful as I was. Um, but I, I think it had some impact, yes. But I think now is probably different in some respects. You know, women, there are women in lots of places in the military now, but uh, there's still a rape culture that I didn't encounter. And so I think there's still, there's still a ways to go in terms of equality. Um. How did your military service impact your feelings about war and the military in general? Well, I'm very proud of the military. Um, at the same time, I think that war is not a good way to resolve problems. And I think we're too quick to go to war. I think we're too quick to go to war to protect corporate interests, which I think it, well, is what Iraq was all about. And I think it's important for veterans to be critical of um, military choices that are mistakes. There's a, someone I, I admire, Andrew Basevich, who was an army colonel, and I follow his work and um, other, you know, 
uh, public intellectuals who were in the military who have criticism of you know choices th that are made politically that are sometimes not made for good reasons either militarily or so societally. So I think it's important for veterans to be part of the friendly opposition where somebody needs to speak out and say that's wrong. Okay. Um, how has the military service impacted your feeling about the military in general? Well, um, The military runs on paperwork, and there's quite often a repetition of doing the same thing again and again without really accomplishing anything. And I, I think there's could be a real need for innovation and streamlining and thinking of doing things in a different way. Um, but it would be hard, I think, to take that out of the military. Probably. <laughs> yeah. What message would you like to leave for future generations who will hear this interview? I would say definitely um, participate. You know, be join the military. See what it's like. Find out. There's great training. There's a great you know life experience. Some of it not easy and not fun, but still really worth doing. And then take whatever you learn in the military and be a better uh, American, a better citizen. Is there anything you feel like we haven't discussed or should be added to this interview? And if so, what? Well, if you ever want salty stories, I have a bunch of those to tell. <laughs> My husband does too. <laughs> what would be an example of a salty story? Well, my husband was on his first submarine and he's walking down the pier and this guy yells at him and he says, hey, what's your name? And he says, Taylor. And he says, no, I mean your first name. And he says, Joe. And the guy responds, well, fuck you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of that kind of, you know, uh, ragging on each other. I think when sometimes people talk about getting rid of hazing in the military, that's probably not necessarily a good thing because there's an across the equator ceremony where people, you know, they crawl through slime from the kitchens and they get pelted with eggs and stuff like that. And then when you cross the equator, you, you become a shellback and you're part of the crew in a way that you never were before. You go from being a newbie to really being, you know, somebody who's salty. And so, I think there are those kinds of things. As it turns out, the guy's name was Richard Panzeri, and he became one of my husband's best friends. <laughs> so do you think that the hazing in some ways builds community, builds esprit de corps? I think it does, yeah. I think it does. Yeah. Okay. Anything else you want to add? Not much, no. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, this has been 